Oh, we all have to put up with this long wait for the hearing people to be accommodated. Here we are, and welcome to the second panel. You, the first panel did a beautiful job, and I love the setup. It's so comfortable, cozy. We'd like to keep up the same comfort, right? The only difference is you're not flies on the wall. Not this time. We want you to participate. This is the topic, artivism, and it has to do with activism. So we want you to participate. So I'd like to show you our plan for the day. First of all, we're going to talk about artivism and its background, give you some examples, because some people aren't aware. And the next thing we'll do is short introductions. I know you know who they are, but we'll go into a little more depth. And then each one will share their work. And you can participate by responding in the moment. You don't have to wait till the end. And then follow up. Well, that'll be questions. It's pretty open. We want this to be interactive, okay? So we're open to all your questions and comments. Am I okay here? All right. What does artivism mean? It's a kind of a new term. It's the combination of art and activism, and we created a single word, artivism. Artivism was, it, it doesn't matter what creates creative item is involved. It's all about social justice and our response to that. And to the, to the um, struggle for human rights that that involves. This is ex the expression of that struggle in any medium necessary, which means poetry, written poetry, film, whatever, everything and anything. You know who this is? Do you know who Pussy Riot is? They're a feminist group of musicians. They made videos in Russia. And they had tremendous struggles with Putin and other members of the establishment, and two members were put in jail for 21 months for their stand against the government regarding human rights, because that is not permitted in Russia. They make music videos. Do you know about Weiwei? Right here? We need, you need to know more. At Alcatraz, you can see um, more about this until April. There's an installation there. He's a Chinese artist, still under house arrest. He cannot leave his home, cannot leave the country. So every bit of communication is long distance. He established an, inst an art, ins they, we established an art installation at Alcatraz. So you take a boat out there and you can look at all of his marvelous stuff. And what it is relates to political imprisonment, prisoners in various countries. There are pictures in the jail itself. So it's in the prison and you see pictures of political prisoners inside a prison. In America, there are political prisoners like Martin Luther King Jr and some who haven't been jailed, like Edward Snowden. He has pictures of these things. But these pictures are made out of Legos. Can you imagine that? You need to see this thing. Grab the opportunity while you're in the area close enough to get to the Bay Area. You know Banksy? Banksy's a British street artist, a graffiti artist. He j he's um, interested in the environment, human rights, he's anti-war, he challenges the, the system. But 
no one knows who Banksy really is. He makes no money at his art. That's not apparently his goal whatsoever. Very, very cool. The visual arts are easier. There are other kinds of performing arts as well, like the vagina monologues. You know about those. And then film. Michael Moore, Bowling for Columbine, a movie that talks about gun rights in America. These are things that we see from the world of people who aren't deaf. But now the question is application to the world of deaf people. We have some artivism that I'd be happy to show you in the vis visual arts. That's the easiest to show you. David Call is a teacher at the California School for the Deaf at Fremont, a marvelous artist. And he was interviewed recently, and he talked about the fact that he calls himself an artivist. And he wrote, uh, he said in this interview, the goal is to expose the world to the deaf community and reframe how they view us. Instead of perceiving us as needing help and to be pitied, we need to change that view. And we need to help them to look at us through our eyes, eyes, through our lens. And maybe that will lead to a much more equal and uh, equivalent way of life for us all and res a level of respect. Isn't that something? That's a pencil drawing, just a pencil drawing. Cochlear implants, handcuffs so that she can't sign. And what about those hands? They're saying, why? What's that hand shape represent? Why? Why? Very powerful image. Another deaf woman often paints things and then talks about what's happening in the picture. She doesn't expect you to understand what's happening right away. This is 12 in 1989, 12 stories related to the FDA experiments with the cochlear implant technology. At that time, 12 kids died, 12 children died during the experimental phase, and that information was hidden from us. And she wanted to bring that out in the open so that we don't forget. Really, to start this panel, Peter helped as we talked about how do we convey messages to the world through activ artivism. Deaf people have had a message all through generations, but do we do it through literature, poetry? What is it? And that's the point. What, I what is the medium? How do we do it? That's the point of our panel. That's a question we'd like to start with. So. If you feel it's repetitive, you don't have to do all this. But if you'd like to, we'd like to know where you grew up and mm -hmm. how you became involved with ASL poetry and performance. And the third point is very important. If you could share an experience uh, or a performance or something that impacted you uh, significantly, and I'm particularly interested that it happened to you early on, and then we'll ask you to share your work. So if you could answer these questions, I'd like to ask Ella to start, if she would. Do you want to have the other, so other performance or other artworks that have impacted me? Yes, for me, the third question 
about artwork. Betty G. Miller, you know, the one who uh, had her incredible artwork about the oppression of sign language. That was in 1982, very early in, the in our history. And yet, it had such a huge impact. And if I look at that, and if you look at that, you see the incredible impact of the intentions of the oral movement of people who force children who are deaf to, si to speak and lip read instead of sign. It's something you can hardly ignore okay. once you've seen the film. I'm, I'm still the thinking. Picture. Shira, would you go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Shira. I grew up in New York. And maybe that's why I signed so fast. <laughs> Sorry. I got involved in performing at a very young age because I was in classes throughout my life in drama. But poetry has been a more recent addition to my life. Something that really impacted me, wa influenced me, was the vagina mono monologues, which I watched while I was in college. I knew it was. I knew there were stories of a people. I realized this is the stories of a people that have been sh are that they're sharing with the broader audience. And I thought, well, I want something like that for deaf people. There wasn't anything like that even in Washington D.C. So I wanted to set up something that was specifically for deaf people. And I thought, great, well, Gallaudet is a deaf center, a center for all deaf people. So I didn't want it only to be deaf students. I wanted to be participating, too. And I wasn't a student there. And they said no. And I said, but I'll just volunteer. And they said no. And I thought, never turn down a volunteer. So I just started my own for the Washington, D.C. area, my own project. In the Washington, D.C. area, they have some rules you have to follow in order to produce something. One of them is you have to have a variety of events prior uh, uh, upcoming to that event. So I uh, did an art deaf women artists exhibit, and that was my second impact, the, the second event that really influenced me. These are people who want to express their experience as deaf women through art, through paintings, and Betty G. Miller was one of those women. Then I saw her, later I saw her home, her studio, um, and it was amazing to see the double influence, that of being a woman and that of being a deaf person. It was, it was very much uh, a big impact on my life. And Peter, would you like to go next? Well, um, I grew up back east. Um, the thing that had the biggest impact on me and inspired me to do poetry was, first of all, Patrick Graybill sitting here. Uh, I was in college at the time. I was expressing myself through written poetry. I didn't know sign language at the time I was college age. I went to NTID and was, uh, if whatever sign language I was using was just following what I was writing. And there was a workshop given by Allen Ginsberg, the, po the poet, Allen Ginsberg, and Robert Panera, a deaf professor at NTID, was having a panel discussion with Allen Ginsberg on our campus. And Allen Ginsberg read from his famous poem, Howl. And there was an interpreter, I think the interpreter was Kip Webster, if I'm right. So he was, you know, dutifully interpreting what uh, Allen Ginsberg was was reciting his poem. He came to this one particular word, the hydrogen jukebox. <laughs> that phrase, hydrogen jukebox, and looked at the interpreter and said, "How do you sign that?" And the interpreter, who was very smart, said, "Ask the deaf people." <laughs> <laughs> and it was Patrick who came up to the came up to the front of the room and. And said, okay, hydrogen jukebox. It was hydrogen jukebox, right? So he did this. <laughs> I looked at that. You know, I was a kid. I was what? What was I? 21 at the time? So green, I had long hair. <laughs> that just touched me. That blew my mind because I had been struggling for so long to create a kind of image through writing. And just seeing him do it in the air just blew my mind. It came right out of his mind <laughs> into the air. And from then on, I was sold. That was that was the moment. When I perform poetry in terms of the deaf experience and activism, um, I've seen a lot. And but I would say maybe five years ago or so, there was a woman from Canada. I think her name is Jolanta Lapita. I'm not sure if I get I'm spelling her last name right. Is it Lapika Lapita? Lapita, she um, gave a performance called Slave, Slavery. 
she had an English dictionary and she was ripping pages out of it and making a long string with the pieces of paper out of the English dictionary. Long string that went all around the room and then lit a match to it so that it burned and it became ashes. And then she swept up all those ashes and kind of uh, using sign language to have those ashes be scattered all over the wall. So you saw her whole concept, it's many, m many oh. layers of meaning to that, and that had a strong impact on you. That was art plus activism right there. You can see this on the internet. I, there's a video of it on the internet. Wonderful, that's great, thank you. Patrick? Well, you know, I grew up in Kansas, and I went to Gallaudet College, And my basic focus at that time was English poetry. Even majoring in English, uh, one thing that struck me greatly was, well, Gulliver's Travels was a required text. And that one didn't strike me. That was sort of a, a ho-hum thing for me to read. It was a satire, but I didn't get that. Little people talking to the big people. Okay, that's nice, nice story. But then ultimately I realized that it was a metaphor for the Irish rebellion against the British. So that was one thing that became an inspiration for me. But the shift from English towards a focus of creation in ASL was another process for me entirely. As Peter shared with you that, that in, in, in interpreting or translating that, that line of the hydrogen goo box, I didn't want to do it, but the whole audience was looking at me, so I had to do something. So I got up on stage, and I found myself giving a, pre a pre prelude of excuses to Allen Ginsberg, saying, well, you know, we don't follow word for word. And he just said, okay, I get it. Just do it, please. And uh, I only had a couple seconds to think of something, and I did it. I felt like I had too many signs in there, and I ended it with something like this. And I told him, that's it. <laughs> and he said, I grant you permission. So many authors are very tied to their words, but he, he felt the impact of that, and I felt the impact of it as well. That, m that Maybe that was the, the beginning of artivism for me. I don't know. I wasn't thinking in those terms at that time. I basically didn't want to upset the hearing people. <laughs> also, I was a good Catholic. I had that big halo hanging over my head that I didn't want to lose. But then along came Ella's work, piece after piece, that spoke truth, my truth. And that's, I think, where I really first started thinking about art as activism. I didn't fully adopt it myself. I, I had some pieces that incorporated an expression of the rage I had experienced. But I don't think artivism is limited to uh, the expression of rage. I think it's also showing hearing people in no uncertain terms that we are people of value. That can be done through theater, through poetry, through visual arts. Last week there was a 25th anniversary celebration of Gaia, and there were visual artworks displayed. And I had seen most of them at some point in the past, or a few of them anyway. There were, there were only a few when it began. But now, they, there were so many artworks, there weren't enough walls for all of them. We haven't yet really had a strong development of, of deaf-originated theater pieces, but I think we will. And artivism, is, as such, is still something pretty new to me. Lovely. And how about you, Ella? Well, I grew up, uh, well, first of all, I grew up in the 50s and 60s uh, before I graduated in 1961. So I grew up in that era. Sorry, before I graduated in 71. I grew up in Berkeley, which was the world center for activism in the, f in the 50s and 60s. Um, definitely the epicenter. Um, I don't believe the deaf community really understood what was going on at the time. Um, the press at the time was very conservative and very critical of the movement. Um, the 
people inside the movement were perceived as hippies and rabble rousers, and much of that uh, was was not picked up on by us in the deaf community. Um, I wasn't even aware of my own oppression as a deaf person who used ASL um, until I got into college and started learning more about it. There were books written by people of that era that had an influence on me. I started to appreciate the movement. Uh, there were certain artworks, certain paintings. Uh, one thing that had a big impact on me was um, Milano. Uh, the, oh, sorry, it was a painting called Milan 1880. And I believe it was it was Goya's painting. Um, it's the, of the, the man at the firing squad. Goya's painting of the man at the firing squad. I think everyone's familiar with that particular painting. I really don't. And then there was the other one by, uh, it was a, it this particular artist, Mary. Mary Thornley. Had um, done a, uh, her work based on that painting, yeah. on Goya's famous painting, but using ASL and called it the conference of the Milan 1880 conference. And that had a big impact on me. I'll never forget that painting. Then the National Theater of the Deaf, uh, even though they were performing <laughs> English, you know, adaptations of English plays, their signing was so artistic, it was very powerful and actually it had the effect of changing the original to me, um, even though everybody would be very critical of the kind of uh, signing they did. There was just sort of a, a, a growing process of doing these works in sign language. So I don't know that it was activism at the time, uh, but then there was My Third Eye, a play that NTD did, which was very powerful, an original work about the deaf experience called My Third Eye, and it was thrilling to see that show. Um, so those are some of the inspirations I had when I was younger. I think you've brought up a wonderful point, and what all of you have said is when a deaf person stands on the stage, that's it. It is an act of artivism when they sign, because there's been so much language oppression in our history. And now, I would like to invite you to share your work. First, Ella's version called, uh, Ella's piece called The Rose Bush, and then you can do your uh, explication before or after. Well, she'll explain a little bit about what inspired her, what helped her to come up with this poem, and then she will respond to anything that you in the audience would like to say or share, and Sean will um, copy sign for us. He will allow you to stay where you are-ish so that he can um, copy what you sign and sign it to everybody. Can we dim the lights, please? Thank you.
Lovely. Excellent. That oh, was just beautiful. When did you do that? Uh, it was 2008. Maybe yeah, before, oh, 2008. Do you want to ask for a response, or do you want to tell us what your inspiration came from, or what came before, or how you came up with this? Well, um, with the history of it, it was, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, um, ASL, you know, I taught ASL for many years, so there was great excitement over people beginning to learn ASL out there in the, the real the world. Uh, but we forgot about the roots of ASL, that the roots of ASL are the deaf community. The deaf community has strong ties to ASL. It's, it's our language. And, and, and so if it's strong, the language uh, needs to be maintained. So we can't, we can't have threats to our language and it have it be threatened with extinction. So that's sort of was the inspiration to this poem. And, th and how can the language survive without the community? You can't have the language without the community. Are there any questions or comments related to this piece? Well, you do, Patrick. <laughs> yes, I do. You're right. ASL classes sprang up, interpreter training grew. Hearing people were learning so much about us in our language, but we weren't. We were too busy helping the hearing people that wanted to learn about ASL and deaf culture that we weren't teaching each other. That's what really, what really struck home with me, and it was that it ended in a question almost an ultimatum. Are we going to do everything for the hearing world or are we going to save ourselves? Any other comments? Judy. You know, I, I lived with Ella for many years and we often talk a lot about her work. Her passion is this language. And she's sort of planting a seed. And she, th the metaphor is she's re saying that it's on us to carefully nurture these seeds and help them develop into healthy plants. Now the garden she's talking about in the piece is how people in showing how people were viewing the flowers is something that they could snip and take home for themselves, but that, they, that the flower would die. And that has to do with us teaching, hearing people. Often they, they take this from us, learn a few signs, go home, and then, you know, they become our allies. But th that's the intention, but do they? What usually happens is they end up taking our language from us, and then it, it, it dies. And do we want that to happen? So again, we go back to the garden and start to share the seeds with each other and ask that who, who has taken a flower give it back have the spirit of giving back so that we can keep our culture going, to keep the sweet scent of our culture going, and that's, that's the hope. That is beautiful. I think the, the message within the messages, we can teach hearing people how to sign, but that will not create a vital language for us we have to teach our deaf children to sign. If we take the language away from children, then the generations in the future will never have this language. So it's an incredibly powerful message of the survival of a people and their language all in one. <coughs> I have a question for you. That was a beautiful poem, and at the end you said, which one? And I'm curious if you had any intention in terms of including that part. 
the question, which one? Or ha as opposed to stopping just before that, the choice to add that sign had intentionality, it helped to give the audience a sense of this is your opportunity to think about that. I'm wondering if people watched without ever thinking about that, it would be a different poem. So I would like to ask what your intention was in putting that question in at the end. Well, first of all, this isn't the end for me. I'm still working on this poem. It's a work in progress. Uh, I performed it in 2008 before this. This is in the same year that it was filmed. Um, but now the same poem is quite different. I think there's, there's a big difference. Uh, what seeing this now, I can see, see how it really has evolved. It's really changed. In terms of adding the question at the end, I think it, it's uh, the metaphors might be kind of mysterious to some people, kind of vague to some people. And so I thought at the end, I, I really needed to, to provoke the audience to pay attention. And I think by asking them that question, um, I'm putting it out to the world saying, what are we going to do about this? And so th I think that's part of the activism, if you will, that's involved in it. Yes, indeed, big time, big time. I teach deaf students and uh, with that poem <coughs> and the treasure. I offer it to them and I say, you know, are you going to oppress or are you going to not oppress? And the students look at me and I go, which? And they say, keep it to ourselves, cherish it, not let it become oppressed. And but the this the requires and a response. And then it's up to them. Yeah. I think that's what artivism sometimes does. It requires a response from people. Shira says, it's a call to action. Good way to say it. Excellent, res uh, excellent phrase. Any other comments or questions related to Ella's recently shown work? All right, good then. Let me get over here. Shira, do you want to introduce it or just go right with it? I'll, I'll give a little bit of background information. I'm going to show a poem that's uh, from an English poetry slam that was spoken. I'm going to show you a minute of it, and then I'll expand on that, okay? And on or not, it has. Um, there will be vocal information here for you on the video itself, we hope. a different poem. I'll, I'll move it on to the another one. Here it is. So. Oh, it's funny we, we had that queued up. were me, my stuffed rabbit, and an American girl doll, she'd line us up at the end of the bed and teach us whatever she'd learned in school that week. Now she teaches ESL at an elementary school in Boston, and every week she tells me stories about her students. Anna does not know how to read in Spanish, much less English, but she still wants to be a writer when she grows up. Juan chooses to stay inside and study at recess so that one day he'll be able to teach his own brother. These kids are good organs in a sick body. In 2001, No Child Left Behind gutted bilingual education. Students who have been in the country for one year are now expected to perform at grade level on standardized English tests. My sister is not allowed to instruct them in Spanish. If the kids don't jump high enough, the school loses money. Improving a school by picking its pockets is like tuning a guitar by ripping off the strings. <laughs> Learning to read in a new language before you can even read in your own is 
like learning to walk while a pit bull is chasing you. <laughs> like learning to sing yeah, with the conductor's <laughs> fist down your throat. This year for my sister's birthday, I got books for her students. A poem on Can we have the lights? Hi. <laughs> we cut it in the middle. You can watch more when you go home. It's called Rigged Game. And the person who's uh, 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 doing the poem is Dylan Garrity. I've watched it a, m uh, a multitude of times and have been very touched by it. And I felt like it was a call to action. He just said it. That's all he did. But I felt it called me that it needed a translation into ASL. So now I'm starting a project of translation into ASL, and I have a film here that talks about what that project looks like, and I'll expand on it in a, in a moment. Hello there, my name is Shira Grabelski. I'm a teacher as well as an artist. I enjoy writing, drawing, and performing. I'm excited to share a particular poem that caught my attention and I feel is imperative to translate into American Sign Language. The spoken word poem is called Rigged Game. Crap. This is how we kept them moving forward. The poet, Dylan Garrity, is a hearing white man who harshly criticizes the education system Many Spanish-speaking children are far behind because the system ignores their native language. This really struck me. This message is more incisive because a white person who is a winner in this unfair system is condemning it. That powerful dynamic I would like to replicate and show how deaf education is very similar. So many deaf children are not learning using American Sign Language. It's either forbidden or has a minimal presence. I needed to look for a winner who can speak about the system. Join us and make this possible. We can translate the poem into American Sign Language and that can become a tool to discuss deaf education, early intervention, and show policymakers how important it is to have American Sign Language in deaf education. This translation will be possible with a fabulous team. Austin Andrews is a person who cares deeply about American Sign Language and deaf education and is a fabulous language model. ASL power. Think about three words today. Three words that are a phrase that have become one of the most potent. He's hearing and he understands this unfair system. So I contacted him and Paul Schreeman. Hello, allow me to introduce myself. This is my name sign and I'm Dr. Paul Schreeman. I've done work with interpreters in the interpreting field, deaf identity and advocacy and ASL in general. As of late, I've been working closely with Autumn. As Shira mentioned, she reached out to us to see if we could collaborate on this project. And since then, we've been having virtual meetings on the topic. We've spent plenty of time discussing the project, and now we're ready to roll up our sleeves and get to work on actually translating that poem, well, I should say transforming that English poem into rich ASL poetry. And here's a sneak peek at some of the rough draft work we've been doing. It's become clear to us that we need more resources. We need more time and money to do this project justice. So we decided to make a Kickstarter campaign and ask for your support in making this inspiration a reality. We're so excited to move forward. I'm here in California and they live in Texas. We'll bring our talents together January 15th through 19th to pour over the video, sign it, film it, edit, and have it ready by February 1st. Once completed, we will share the link far and wide to the deaf community, the signing community,
schools, interpreter training programs, and policymakers so we can demonstrate how crucial ASL is in deaf education. Your support will help a lot. It means a lot. Thank you so much, and don't forget to spread the message. Thank you. I hope that you'll watch that poem. It's very touching. And I feel like you can't just look at, I felt I couldn't just think what a cool piece. I had to do something about it. So as I talked to people, I was even more confirmed in my feelings. And I thought, maybe not just um, about deaf people specifically. That's why I asked you, Ella, about as adding the question uh, at the end of your piece. But just, it's about us, the world, everyone. Um, thank you. Does anyone have a response or a question? One that I have is I really like the idea of using Kickstart to Kickstarter to incorporate the community. It becomes our project, not just your project. So that's really, really nice. Peter. Yeah, if, if I may, uh, so you're the contact person? Or sorry, have you been in touch with the poet? Yes, I made contact with him last year after long thought. I watched it and then I contacted him through Facebook and told him I loved your his poem and I want to translate it into ASL. I didn't ask his permission. I said I'm going to do it. I just let him know and he said cool beans. So we were we were good. Uh, at the beginning I thought of a deaf person who might sign it. I'm deaf. You know, I wanted a deaf friend to try. I asked that deaf friend and that deaf friend said yes and time got passing and we got busy. And then I thought, wait a minute, Dylan's a white man. He's a winner. He understands the system. And he's coming out in front of his own people, t criticizing them. So I want to make that same kind of impact. So here we are. I thought what would be perfect would be a hearing person who would attack the system, but not a person who can't sign. Those are the people who make decisions for us. That would defeat the purpose, Those, and if it wasn't in ASL. So I moved over to a hearing person who can sign well and who is also part of the team. I wanted a vested interest as well. So I contacted Austin, Audi. Kenny? So Why did you specifically choose Austin? That's a great question. It came up in conversation with friends. I was saying I was trying to think of a hearing person who signs well and who would um, enjoy that kind of work and I don't know, it, it, his name came up, and it kept coming up over and over again, and I thought, well, uh, something about it just felt right to me, and we have really made a good connection. And because he's from Rochester, from he's from Rochester, New York, what can I tell you? That's true, says here. I noticed, I think you saw a little of the clip. What did you notice that was parallel with deaf education? in the thing in the in the poem in terms of Spanish speaking kids. What what was similar about deaf kids and Spanish speaking kids? Well of course you just substitute ASL and for Spanish and it's the same. And did you want to add something, Peter? No, no. I'm sorry, the light's right in our eyes so it's hard to see, says Shira. Well I have to admit the captions went by awfully quickly for me, so I was trying to keep up and it was a little tough. But there was a line somewhere at the end about the was that, was a bulldog or something. That one really grabbed me. I could easily imagine trying to learn to walk while a bulldog is chasing you. <laughs> that was a, such a vivid image. And that struggle felt familiar. That was very powerful. I, I really am wondering how that's going to come I'm out in the I'm curious, too. I know. I think that will be a huge challenge, too. And that's why I wanted a team. I wanted a deaf person, Paul, and Auti. And I wanted to find somebody that I felt could really let go of English too, but still maintain the imagery. You saw maybe two images that were fabulous, but there were so many in this piece. I, I was taken aback moment by moment, second by second. There, there's one more back here. I have a question. Do you plan to translate the entire piece or just the sections of it? Oh yeah, you interpreted that great. Oh, three minutes maybe. It, it, it's only three minutes, but he talks really fast. 
So that's going to be another huge challenge, but we're going to translate the entire thing. I have a question. Uh, so was it spoken in kind of a rap? What, what sort of um, cadence was it? It's called a slam. It's spoken word. So he's speaking fast? It's, th- it's, it's that kind of, what's the style called? It's called slam poetry. Hmm. Slam poetry. It's spoken word, says Peter. It's, it's called spoken word. Spoken word poetry, it's, it's, a, it's a free, free reign. You can do it to any sort of rhythm you want. Um, it's been going on now for at least 10 years and uh, really rapidly yes. spreading. Uh, in Chicago, we started, uh, you know, or poetry slams hit starting off there. Um, it, it started off as a way of just reacting to the world and th- any way you wanted. And uh, it can involve music, it can involve talking, and it can involve, it's a very free medium in within poetry. Now lots of schools have Poetry Slam events. I'd love to see the deaf schools have them too. There's a wonderful movie of high school students in a competition doing spoken word, and it's so real, so real. I'm curious. You tend to match style. So when you were signing a Poetry Slam, what do you think that would look like? Do you think it would be fast? In ASL, do you think it would be like a spoken word? Well, I've spent a lot of hours on this, experimenting to see what might work. I really want the message to be more important than the form, but at the same time, I'm very interested in the form, and it must have a sense of urgency. I don't, I don't want it to look, you know, casual. I want it to look urgent. So um, we're going to voice over with Dylan's voice. He's... Um, given us approval for that, so I may be stuck. I may have to drop that due to the speed, but the link, I mean, people can use that for anything, so I'm very curious to see if it will become a call for action, and I'd love to see the results, and I'm ready to create materials to support that conversation. Education is a critical place to make a call for action. Thank you so much. call to action. (coughs) Um, Peter's going to perform, so let's leave the lights on. Thank you. (coughs) So before I I go on to this, I want to explain. This was created during uh, Obama's first campaign, which, was that 04? No, it was 2008. It was 2008. Obama's first campaign in 2008. Kenny and I uh, were inspired by this and his message of hope and change and we were all inspired and wanted to come up with something. And we put it out there, put it out on YouTube. At the very end of the piece, it says, it's time for a change, support Obama, right? That was the tagline at the end. But um, to be honest, I wasn't happy with it. Um, And we weren't happy with Obama, actually, in the end. We weren't happy with Obama. So, yes, we still believe it, and I, maybe he does too, but in terms of his policies and where things are going, I'm not really happy with it. Um, and and th- so that's why I'm going to do perform it for you live here instead of showing you the YouTube clip. And Kenny's going to perform it with me. This, I'm sorry. This poem is about America's addiction to oil. It's called Lead. Sorry, not enough practice for you. Good luck. (laughs) Good luck to you. You didn't practice it either. (laughs) (laughs) Lead, 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 oil, Derek, pumping. Oil, oil, filling the hull of this tanker, this huge ship with oil, this tanker with smokestacks, this ship on the sea, bearing smoke. It's linked by oil lines to a tractor trailer tanker filling its tank full. This tanker exhaust on the highway to a gas station filling its tank full. 
a car at the pump filling its tank. Car exhaust driving pulls over. Chops down a tree, chops up a tree, compresses it, chemical waste, fish. Compresses it to a single sheet of paper, types up the notice, air mails it, jet fumes, jet to a house, door open, envelope open. It's the notice. So he straps on a helmet, grabs a gun, and you can imagine war. He's shot, he's buried, he's covered under a cross. His coffin is compressed till it drips precious fluids of need, need, need. Wow. Wow. I ha have you ever seen that before? Oh, I have. Wow. I've seen it on YouTube. And you've yeah, got it yes, it's still there on YouTube. It's still there, but uh, the ending saying support Obama is uh, no longer necessary. <laughs> well, we can go beyond that, right? We can go up to that point. Anybody have any responses? I think for me, there's so much said in so little space. So much is happening in such a compacted version about why war happens or related to our addiction to oil. Plus, this business of the handshakes being so magnificently mm -hmm. planned out, mm -hmm. it was just marvelous and wonderful. Also, I think it was a great example of deaf people talking about things outside of just deafness. We're citizens of the world. Injustice occurs anywhere, and, it's a th and there are threats to justice everywhere, as Martin Luther King Jr. said. I think it's important that we are part of the human rights environment as well, not just deaf issues. Not to say that deaf issues aren't important. Our lives are important, and our issues are important, but there are other things that are important as well. Does anyone else want to ask a question or make a comment? Um, yeah, I agree with you. Not every piece has to be an act of, re of defiance. It depends on the artist's intention. And it doesn't always have to be about the deaf experience either. Clearly that piece wasn't. The piece I did last night, I performed it as a deaf person and there was no English interpretation. It wasn't specifically about deaf issues. Uh, the rigged game isn't about deaf issues either, but it's easily applicable to deaf issues. And then as I'm leaving things up to the audience's interpretation, I think that the rigged game being about Spanish speakers in its original form, I think is very easily transferable to the deaf experience, but I don't want us to overlook the, the injustices being done to students who speak Spanish as a first language in the educational system. So I, I think that, that that's important for us to bear in mind, that we have other responsibilities in our work as well, not just focusing on the, the value of our own language. Thank you, Patrick. Very well said. What I was wondering about is actually relevant to a couple of you up here. With that uh, rigged game project, it could be that as you create, are you, are you doing more of an adaptation for the deaf audience or a translation? I would know if I'd call. I don't know if I'd call it an adaptation, more a straight translation. Right. So that means you're leaving the topic about the original topic. But if you were to try to make it about the deaf experience, would we consider that more of an adaptation? I think so. He has this image about a guitar string um, breaking, but I think. If he, ta he talks also about shoving something down someone's throat, I want to keep those. It, it blocks a person from singing, but uh, they're not part of the deaf experience. But I feel like those are powerful images. That's great. Because of what's happening in the elections, you decided to talk about that, right? The two of you talked about it and decided to create that poem. 
and it was that was the genesis of that creation? Well, actually, you know, we often have a lot of discussions and dialogues. Obviously, we like d talking about politics because um, it, life is hard. <laughs> yep, there. But don't point out there. It's hard right here, too. Right. <laughs> it's not life up there. It's like, yeah, life down here as well. I, I guess it's Le Leela's uh, educating us about where to position our signs. Anyway, um, so as if life isn't hard enough, you know, you see sometimes that all it takes is common sense that uh, some of these issues are really difficult and that, you know, gets me going and I want to express myself about it. And so, yes, we have death issues that are very emotional and passionate for us, but we live in the whole world as well with its issues. And, um, and I have poetry about both of those. Um, D don't forget, we, we live in a mainstream society as well that's got issues going on that affect us too. We're not just in our own world, we live in theirs as well. And so where we can point something out, let's do it. Um, everything I've seen going on with the government, this is my personal, my humble opinion, I feel like things have not been great. Uh, there's been some positive, lots of negative, and I feel like for them it was, it was time for me to express myself about it. And technique is the is the technique for that is poetry, and I could see an easy transformation there uh, for me to, to use that sign for need along with a sign that indicates oil rigs and that I could show the repetition. Um, and this issue is still going on; it's still there. Uh, and so, this is how I express myself about that issue. Kenny, did you want to share your thoughts on it? No. Shira, and then Judy. I wonder if you have this written somewhere where I can read the English translation. Let me just crack open my head and have it pour out before you. <laughs> that needs to be documented too. Yeah, translation as an issue uh, from ASL to English is very interesting. When I compose a poem and sign and then I see the English translation, Kenny looks at it, he, he chooses certain words um, that pop out at him from, from the translation. So it, it just like, uh, it's so that it has the same cadence sometimes as spoken, a spoken word poem. And so you'll often see, if you're looking at the written translation of what Kenny said, there's vast gaps between words. Interesting. Judy, would you share your thoughts? One thing that I struggle with uh, pertaining to your ideas of this artivism idea, my time is the 40s and the 50s. The older people didn't really talk about politics that much in my time. And it wasn't to oppress people or to, it, it was out of respect for others. They didn't want to engage in that sort of thing. But now, I think it started maybe when Kennedy decided to bomb Cuba that we couldn't hold things in any longer. And then when he was assassinated, that really opened the doors. What we saw mostly, though, was deaf people focusing on their jobs. A lot of them worked in the printing field and taking care of their families. And I do, I'm not talking about the younger people now, I'm talking about um, people who grew up in the 60s and 70s throughout the, that era of revolution, the drug era and what have you. I think that it's hard to get people from our community more politically involved. But we need to find a way, maybe through video, through performing arts. I think that's something that's often missing. I think we need more of it. We need people to see a lot more out there and not just rely on things that are in black and white. They can't rely on being told what to think. They need to see art which encourages them to think. 
through things that they see and things that they may be they may be involved in. There may be things that are brought into us from media and the hearing world, but I don't see much of that yet. Not enough of it anyway. Okay. Um, great comment. Let's see if there's anyone else who has a response. Oh, there's someone over here? Okay. And then we'll come back over to the other side. Hi. I think artivism is very powerful. The message can be very clear. Some poetry, of course, isn't. It's very artistic, experiential, emotional. But artivism, to me, is something that's a lot more pointed. It the whole go the whole point is transparency. The whole point is to stop hiding. So it can be a very powerful, uh, powerful critique of the system, and it can be very aggressive in, a in its own way, or it can be more subtle. So I'm wondering what you guys think, how you decide how, how aggressive to be in your critique of what's wrong, the degree that to which you do that. How do you decide to take that risk of putting it out there 100% or how much do you want to create it in a more artistic expression? And maybe that's I'm really what I'm really getting at is what your process is. That's a great question. I think I can answer that. Um, actually, I have two responses to that. Um, first of all, Judy, I think you're right. History is important. Uh, nowadays, people aren't aware of their history. You know, history repeats itself if you ignore it. You know, uh, in our national elections, thirty only 36 percent of Americans voted. That's less than uh, the the oh lowest yeah. since 2002. Si sorry, since World War II, so only 36%, and now look at what the result is. So people need to be educated that you can't ignore it. I think the same thing you were worried about in the 40s, we're worried about now again. Everyone's thinking, oh, this doesn't affect me, it's all those people over there. But it does, guess what, it does affect you, it's affecting all of us. Now, in terms of uh, Iva's question about taking risks and how aggressive you're going to be, Sometimes the intent isn't I'm going to be as aggressive as possible. The intent is just make my statement, express myself, and then through doing more research, reading, watching films, whatever, I, I may get inspired by that. And Kenny and I will bounce an idea back and forth with each other. My experience, I think uh, the most terrifying thing was, <coughs> was a poem, was uh, Scare Talk. Or, sorry, order to talk. This was the only poem where I used my voice. Now, I wasn't, you know, see, I still have to explain myself, right? See, that's part of my fear. Um, I'm not uh, skilled in my speech skills, but I was a person who was trained in that oral method for years. I had their language, I had their language imposed on me and when I, the poem is about me sort of regurgitating and spitting it right back out at them. And, you know, so when, of course, I use my own voice in the poem, the hearing people are quite taken aback. They're not expecting to hear this kind of distorted speech, you know. And deaf people are thrown completely off by it. Because they don't know what I was saying or what for what reason am I talking. So there's the balance there between hearing and deaf people's situation. Now, ironically, there's a lot of research and linguistic research out there that, that's sort of right there in my poem. And they're out there using my poem as a way to understand the deaf experience. They're saying, yes, this in a nutshell describes the whole thing. It's right there in the poem. He's standing there speaking. Is that out of... Uh, and I say, out of all the sign language poetry I've done, you pick the one where I speak. Because sometimes you throw an idea out there and, and it doesn't really work, and then other times you throw something out there that you think is going to fail or it isn't funny, and it turns out to be you know, a hit. It turns out to be something that people really get. So you really don't know when you start out where it's going to go. For me, art is easier to express than to express my opinions in, in words, you know, to just sign it or say it. I've tried to 
tell about my feelings and that causes more uproar. But when I do it through art, less uproar because people are intrigued by the beauty of it, by the cleverness of it. The message will hit, but they still appreciate it. So that's a good thing about artivism. Through art, people are drawn in, but they still get the message. But in other forms, it can be very controversial and, and people feel attacked or, or angry. Kenny wants to respond. Uh, to answer Ivor's question, we uh, never, I don't want to say never, but the poem has its own process. We don't set out with the goal of, of um, attacking or critiquing this or that or the other thing. Right. We start with the truth. And we play off of each other and we play off of the truth and it leads us in whatever direction it goes and then we end up with something like that. It's its own creative process. So it's not as intentional as that. That we, we didn't go and pick, we didn't go through and pick those signs for that purpose. It's just that that's what needed to happen. And often we would come out and we would come up with things that we ended up deciding not to use because it went too far from what we're the what the organic intent seemed to be. There's something organic where we're simply pretty much following the poem. This is great. Is there any time at which you say, oh my gosh, what have I done? I can't show this to people. <laughs> Do you ever feel a sense of risk for any reason? I've never felt that about the poem, but it's interesting. It's kind of the irony, you know. Um, Kenny's version is often more controversial than mine, but because the hearing people hearing his translation, uh, they're the ones that you know it gets a rise out of them. Um, I sort of have a funny story. We were in Virginia at a church. Uh, it's called First Night. It was the New Year. It was going to have no alcohol at this event for the first oh. night of the New Year's. This was a popular thing that was going on in the 90s. People would have a first night event. And so I did the poem about a Dutch. Oh. <laughs> and about uh, th an army sergeant is uh, uh, yelling at the dog and saying, I'm going to chop your fucking head off. Or I'm going to blow your fucking head off. I'm going to blow your fucking head off. And so, you know, Kenny uses that the F word and, you know, sort of blew the audience away. And I never said the F word in my train and I never used the F sign, if you will. Well, so a person came up to me, you know, someone and someone was interpreting and said, you know, that poem is beautiful. Why did you use the ing that F word? And I said, the ing word, the ing word. And I went, the ing word? What's an ing word? You know, I, I never said ing. <laughs> you don't like ing? Why don't you like ing? And then someone told me what they really heard. And I said, oh, well, you know, that's... Uh, I, that oh, that's the moment that I learned. Oh, he says that in a church? <laughs> <laughs> now the story's not over. So then uh, my dad lived in that town. And so uh, I went into the bar and, uh, you know, it was, you know, first it was 10 seconds till New Year's, you know, because this was all on New Year's Eve. My, my dad said, boys, sit down. You don't need that word fucking. If your your poetry is beautiful and strong enough without that word. And my father's standing there preaching to us while the countdown's going four, three, two, one. My dad's going, I don't care if it's Happy New Year. Uh, it's going to be New Year when I decide it's New Year. When I'm done, that's what we're going to celebrate. And we're like, okay, Dad, okay. He went on and on until he was then said, Happy New Year, boys, and gave us a big hug. So I thought, wow, I don't realize. It shows you how powerful language is, you know, that uh, – whether you're being vague or you're being very explicit, uh, really, to be honest with you, um, there's, there's, it's that's really not the point. We just realize that th there's shock value sometimes isn't helpful. Sometimes less is more, and when you tone down that shocking stuff, it becomes more real to people. I have a question for you. And we took the word out of the poem. I have a question. 
Um, as you work in the, as a team between spoken English and assigned ASL, I know the ASL is the center and everything else seems to be around it from my observation of your work, but have you ever thought about playing with the idea that people are so dependent on the spoken word? Do you think, you know, I wonder if you've ever thought of having him do something in a sweet, sweet <laughs> style and have the voice be really, really rancorous or vice versa, have his signing be very rough and the spoken word be very soft and yeah, sweet? Actually, we do play with that. We, we've done that. Uh, you know, give people that, ex that conflict experience. You know, oh. I'll be very super active and Kenny's voice seems very neutral and detached or very sweet while, while I'm being very emotional. So there's that dissonance we're creating uh, in the audience. Uh, he has you know, things he does where he taps the microphone to and makes certain sounds. Also, I, I don't want you to leave without knowing that we took the word fucking out of the poem, okay? <laughs> it hasn't been in there since because his dad really lit into us. <laughs> Ella says his dad was really powerful. Before we go on with more discussion, Patrick ha is the one left to share his poem, okay? Okay. Don't Ye turn off the lights because he's going to do it live. Some of you saw this last night or what you saw me perform last night. I I had several haikus under the title Memories. I've created four, and I picked two. I, I, I still have to be get myself organized here. Okay. Without interpretation. That was number one. Here's the second. Sorry, false start. Now, whether I would call this artivism, I would never have thought that until today's discussion, actually. And now I think maybe it is, maybe they are. And I say that because they both want the audience to understand the value of the, the traditional schools for the deaf, to deaf people, to the deaf community. It might take some people aback. It also might give some people uh, some uh, an insight into just how horrible the educational conditions have been for deaf students through the years. Interesting. I've always liked that mitten image, very powerful metaphor. Mittens are soft. No big deal. You can break, break the string, the yarn of the mitten, but the message behind isn't soft at all. It looks soft, but it isn't. It's harsh. So thank you. Yes? I would just like to add to, um, to Judy's comments earlier about generational differences. You and I, Judy, and some of you up here, uh, grew up trusting authority. We felt that the politicians were uh, worthy of our trust. Big business was worthy of our trust because our parents were earning a living, they were feeding us and providing us a safe place to live. And while we were little, there was the dark underbelly uh, sort of boiling up there that we never could see. We, could, we couldn't notice that. And those who did see it and sense it were the artists. It was the artists who uh, would 
bared their souls and dared to expose this underbelly and realized that all was not what it seemed. So to say, you know, the expression is nothing new under the sun. Um, I remember the 60s. I remember there was a kind of, a, uh, there was a song called, well, there was kind of a song, music called folk music. And it was beautiful, but it was also artivism. And there was one song that was by Peter, Paul, and Mary. And it's called, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? It had a sort of a cycle in the song, just like your poems, um, a very similar message and a kind of a cyclicalness to the poem, to the song. And it sounds pretty. It's a very pretty, light kind of song, but the message behind it is activism, I think, artivism. I think that's what is happening now with the young people we have here, with everyone in this room. You know, they know, they know that they can't uh, trust. Uh, you know, their trust has been destroyed, and so they uh, they're aware, and so they're starting where we left off, if you will. So. I wonder if you, Shira, would like to respond to him because you're a young person. Your uh, art is of the, the moment of today. Yes, I think young people have a responsibility to be aware, to be alert. I think many people in my generation are aware, but there are many who are not aware. Some are very engaged in the context of politics and other things, and others are not. I really appreciate being in a community where there's dialogue, where we do things about it, where we do video uh, vlogs, videos on the, on the internet, and performances regarding um, oppression, theater of oppression. I would love to see more of that. I saw that when I was younger, but I haven't seen any of late. I think that would have a great deal of power in our community. Audience involvement to create change. I took a workshop with Julian Bowl, the son of one of the founders, and I really, it gave me a great reminder to think about that kind of thing. There was one other thing, ah yes, about a poem. Somebody was talking about the poem that starts, first they came for, you know that poem, uh, from the German experience I have. I had planned to sign it here. I have it somewhere in my uh, USB thumb drive, but you know the idea of that poem is we always think somebody else will take care of it, but if you leave it to others, then pretty soon you'll, they'll come for you. And I think that's the whole thing of artivism that's new to me. So maybe that's why I, I would start this with a small step, translation. And now maybe I'll find other forms of expression and ways to add to artivism. Well, what is it? We should give people the names of we're just giving a name to something that's been going on for a long time. It's not a new concept, artivism. All of you have done this all your for a long time at any rate. I think it's not something new. It's just a name that's new. That And names help us to sort of uh, congeal our thoughts. So I think there's time for one last comment from each of you. Patrick? I think Judy made a good point. Basically, it has to do with deaf people's feelings that there are things we can't do. We can't join the military. We can't do this. We can't do that, at least as far as other people tell us. And so often our poetry is focused on our own community issues. Speaking out against the Vietnam War, why should we do that? Sort of is how many people felt. Because we didn't feel ownership in that. What we felt ownership in 
was what was closest to us in our own community. And that's why Ella's work has been so touching. Other pieces we might feel more distance from. So I think that's an important point that Judy made. So now this is the second panel of the day. And just like the first one, <laughs> must it end? Oh, that's dear. That's really dear. Would you like to share a final comment, or do you feel that was sufficient, Sheila? Do you have a final comment? Yes. You asked before where we got our inspiration, and I thought and thought about that. And I remembered my parents talked about Bob Dylan, Pete Seeger, and all these different song lyrics. And you're right. Those were those people were artivists. They were already there. You're right. It's been around for a long time. For me, you know, whatever issue is out there, I may have an opinion on. But I look to myself as an activist, as a a literature a literate activist. So Western literature. You know, this is now coming from the academic world. They defined lit they define literature as reading and writing, things that are written down. So my job is to prove to that world that no, all kinds of things can be literature. Um, there's a lot of spoken languages without a written form that have their own poetry, jokes, and whatnot. Uh, sign languages have that, and so there. To I, my job is to point out to them that their lens is too small. And that they need to widen, you know, take it off their ear and put it toward their yeah. eye. And so, and so when I get my foot in the door to, to their world, to be able to point this out to them, Chris Prince, who's uh, in the ASL program at the University of Virginia, he finally convinced the provost of the university, I think, uh, for the, uh, in, a, in a ten year plan to uh, outlining their literature program, to put ASL oh. literature in the curriculum, in what the school offers. Um, now, they've been in, uh, at a university for over 200 wow. years, and now finally ASL literature is taking its rightful place in this canon. So, you know, we're here to stand in the mainstream and point out <laughs> that um, this exists in the world, in the whole body of literature, and this is going to have a huge impact on deaf children. For deaf children Absolutely. to see deaf adults oh. standing on stage yes. signing, that's a huge impact. And these deaf children have a right to own their language. <laughs> and so I think uh, through the, the dramatic work and the academic recognition, it's a double uh, whammy on that. Absolutely. I think when you have the double role of our work in ASL and deaf literature, I think of what Patty's one comment was. I don't know if I remember it precisely, but it was deafhood or deaf studies may be mankind's final frontier. Do you remember that quote, Patty? Well, let it me think. It was deaf or deafhood or deaf studies or deaf something may be people's, mankind's final frontier. I thought about what you've talked about, Peter, about your work and about the variety of issues of concern and whatever. And many people in the community are aware and activists and deaf people look at that and talk to one another and and we have a, a, an oppressed experience and other people are often unaware of that. We know about our lives, but others don't and they don't understand the oppression that we experience from within our own families, within our own schools. We move through our world every day and say, you know, it's deaf people are great, we're great, but what is it that we're thinking? What's our interior life like? So it's something that the, the world in general does not understand yet or has not been exposed to this, and it's time to focus on that. But at the same time, we need to be focused on other things and exchanging ideas with others and creating al allyships al with other allies, with other people. And we need to take uh, over our, our, our destiny from the corporate world that's so involved in this cochlear implant concept they're so, they're such believers that it's the best thing that could possibly happen. They put out this propaganda that deaf people don't know what they're talking about, and we need to put out propaganda that this is all about fi finance. They're just making a profit on us. 99% of the people who 
are in the world are making it just barely on their paychecks, and this tiny percent is running the world with their millions and millions of dollars. Well, the same thing is true. That's in the bigger landscape of the universe. But the same thing is true for us. Our education, our bodies, our lives in general are being de determined by others. So we have to create al allyships. We have to create um, s some form of alliance so that we can create um, our future together. And this one vehicle, sign language, is a very powerful way that we can make that partnership with others. And then we can start to help people understand better and better how they are taking advantage of our vulnerability and their o power and privilege. And that was a huge piece of the message of the rose bush. So I feel strongly about spreading that message. I'm thinking that as we close, what I want to say is the world is ready or is it? Is the world ready or do we need to do something to help raise deaf children in the most effective way? And to borrow Ella's question, which is it going to be? Thank you, each of you, for your participation in the panel. Thank you.